Hey everyone, Brayden here coming to you with a very special video. On this channel, usually I bring you the news in the most succinct way possible. I like to make very good use of your time, not waste it, bring you guys the big news that I know will interest almost all of our audience. And this scruple that I use has resulted in us covering less of the little day-to-day -day stuff that has been happening at Disney. But lately, there's been a lot of these little developments around the parks that I think are worth covering here today. And of course, we have a lot of fans that say, Brayden, do a podcast. Brayden, tell us about your day-to-day -day experience at the park and things of that nature. You know, Brayden, when are you gonna make a video about this little obscure news item? You know, did you see the new paint at the seas or did you see that they did something new with Soren? So today we are going to combine all of that into one very extensive, highly detailed news report where we are going to cover everything big happening at Walt Disney World, as well as lots of the little updates happening around the resort you might miss when you're walking around the parks. I'm also going to give you some personal anecdotes from my recent experiences, my recent trips out to the parks, and I've also got a very in-depth report for you guys on what I call the de-theming of Disney's formerly Victorian resort, which of course is the Grand Floridian. There'll be chapters on the video timeline below if you just wanna jump around. We've got a lot to get into, so sit back and grab a snack. This is going to be a lot of fun. First, for context, I recently moved out of my apartment in Orlando, which I moved into back in 2019, as many of you will recall. And while I have big life plans that require me to be located a little further away from Walt Disney World, I'm still close enough to go cover all the big stuff in person and do the epic universe updates and things like that. So I will be in Orlando frequently. For example, I spent a day driving each direction to go cover the Brightline opening in Orlando a couple of weeks back. I grabbed a hotel for the weekend and hit up the parks. So it's no big problem insofar as the channel is concerned. Nothing's changing content wise, but since I'm going to be physically located further away where I can't just, you know, go for an afternoon or something like that. Before I moved out of Orlando, I wanted to build a really, really nice library of parks footage to be able to show you guys as B-roll during these Disney News videos. And this was no small task because Walt Disney World has four parks, so many resort hotels, and the place is huge. And I did not manage to capture everything. I think it's impossible to do that. I've captured a lot though. So for weeks and weeks in August and September, almost every day I was pounding the pavement at Walt Disney World. I met a bunch of you viewers, which was awesome. You guys are great. And this wasn't the sort of thing where I was doing a typical Florida local day at the parks, you know, where you just go in and you hit a few things and then you say, eh, you know, I'll come back another day. I was about to move out. So I was a full-fledged tourist in terms of trying to maximize each day at the parks from dawn till dusk, documenting everything that I possibly could. Usually I avoid eating at the parks because I think the food is overpriced. These days I was there, I had to eat in the parks because I was there the entire day. Not only that, but I also had a lot of time to really pay attention to a lot of the little theming details you miss when you're running around trying to hit attractions. I also caught some amazing scenes where the lighting conditions or the nature or the weather, it was just right. I also had my film camera with me some of those days. So since I know some of you guys are just here for the big new items, what's going on, at Disney right now. We are going to start off with those big news items and then we'll get into more of the niche stuff. So firstly, in my opinion, the biggest new attraction at Walt Disney World for October of 2023, it's not Journey of Water inspired by Moana. If you have children that want to have fun cooling off in the summer months, or if you want to take some cool photos or just be able to relax in the shade for a while, which is an activity that previously in Epcot uh, wasn't something that you could really enjoy in this area, Journey of Water should be great for all of that. But much more ubiquitous in its appeal year round with every type of guest is a new attraction that just opened over at the Land Pavilion. Everyone wants to do this thing. You might've heard of it before. It's called Soarin'. That's right, for the Disney 100 celebration, which kicked off at Epcot on September 22nd, Disney removed Soarin' Around the World, the film we've had on the ride since 2016, and reverted for a limited time to showing the original Soarin' Over California film, which isn't just a different film projected on the Omnimax dome screen. Soarin', as you know, is a 4D experience, so this also requires 
require Disney procuring their patented fragrances that they use for this version of the film. The orange smell is back, the pine tree smell is back. Disney even altered the Soren entrance marquee to reflect this change at Soren, where it no longer says Soren around the world. And Disney makes note that this is a limited engagement offering for the Disney 100 celebration. How long this version will be around, we don't know. I'd be optimistic and say we've probably got a good year to enjoy this thing, but not to amplify the FOMO Disney's clearly trying to generate here, you are going to want to hop over to Epcot sooner rather than later and check this out because it's the bomb, it's the best, and we don't know just exactly how long it's actually going to be around. I'll get to more on Soarin' Over California in a second, but first, you might be wondering, this is special for the Disney 100 celebration. So, Brayden, what even is this anniversary? Is this even real? Well, it's celebrating 100 years of the Walt Disney Company. Disney's previously celebrated their 100th anniversary as well. So, here's the thing. This anniversary, it's pretty contrived, all right? Disney is using this to have something to drive merchandise sales, re-release all sorts of movies and classic films, things like that, do all sorts of fancy merchandise that they can put in the Targets and the Walmarts and all of that. I actually think the chief motivation for this anniversary in particular, insofar as the parks are concerned, is to drive locals and pass holders to Disneyland and Walt Disney World, both of which are approaching or have already approached completely stagnant attendance. They're both reaching a plateau in their growth. The 50th at Walt Disney World, it was really just aesthetic stuff because it had all its real attraction upgrades cut by Walt Disney World president Jeff Volley. He cut the Carousel of Progress update, which would have added Walt to the intro. He cut a bunch of other updates around the Magic Kingdom, like adding explosion effects to Big Thunder and much more. What we ended up getting was a two-year merchandising thing, which really only physically manifested in the sunburned Cinderella a castle, which still has yet to be reverted back to its normal paint colors. We did get some cool stuff like the lights on Spaceship Earth. That was definitely the highlight. And here's the thing, back over at the castle, doing something special with the castle means that there is something special going on, that it's a special time to be at the parks. And this is the big thing that I wanted to touch on before getting back over to Soarin' Over California, which is with this anniversary Disney's doing, which doesn't have much real significance, and it's bookended by all these other anniversaries. There's more coming after this, I'm sure. And we just had a several years long anniversary at Walt Disney World. When you constantly have these anniversaries where you go from 50 to 100 and there's still 50th anniversary merch in the gift shops and there's also stuff that has the 100 number on it. When these anniversaries seem permanent, where now Disney said that they are keeping the special Walt Disney World 50th anniversary Fab 50 statues in the park in perpetuity, when the castle is still by all intents and purposes still the 50th castle minus the 50 medallion on it, it becomes diminishing returns where we get special anniversary fatigue and it's ability to draw guests to the resort is diminished. If every day of the year was your birthday, your birthday would be like any other day. It wouldn't be special at all, right? So getting back to this Disney 100 celebration, which is headquartered at Epcot of all places, denoted by big 100 medallions and banners on lampposts all over the park. And there's a Mickey and Minnie figurine, which you can get photos with over by the port of entry. There's some special food and wine booths this year with Disney 100 offerings. They have the 100 medallion on the booth. Uh, how they're special any other way, I'm not really sure. And of course, we have the limited time engagement with Soren. I immediately identify with all these things what the goal here is. It's not to draw in high per guest spend guests from New York that are gonna spend 10 grand on a week's long vacation because they fear missing out on this once in a lifetime anniversary. This anniversary I strongly suspect does not have the same draw as the 50th. Disney's high guest spend far away guest attendance is down and we can infer that by looking at the decreasing booking volumes at the resort hotels. What is Disney doing here with these limited time food booths and limited time little pieces of merchandise all over the gift shops? Does that draw people from Texas and North Dakota and Maine and Toronto to Disney who say, we can't miss out on this? No, of course not. It's about constantly having little new things, little new decorations, little new planters, to get the pass holders in Florida and the pass holders in California to make more trips out to their respective parks and resorts and spend more money. Maximize the amount of money that Disney is juicing out of these locals to make up 
for what is plateauing growth from their faraway visitors. The fact that Disney is clearly focusing more on attracting locals at their domestic resorts is a bearish sign stock-wise to me because it means that Disney isn't getting as many of those high guest spend, really, really good out of state and international folks that they were getting in mass back in 2021. And if we look at Disney stock, it is reflecting uh, this change in tone. I think that investors definitely see what's going on here. But here's the thing, I'm just trying to explain to you what the deal is with this anniversary. I'm really not actually trying to bash it because a side effect of Disney trying to constantly generate little new draws to get locals and pass holders to head to the parks and spend money it does sometimes result in us getting some really cool stuff, like us getting Soarin' Over California back at Epcot. So getting back over to Soarin' Over California, what did I think of this thing after not being able to see it for eight years? In my opinion, and this is something that I can and will substantiate, this is the best version of Soren. It is better than Soren around the world by most metrics. So I'm just going to run through these. The biggest advantage is this film, this original film, it's not CGI. The more recent Soren film Disney produced, almost every scene is partly fake and in some cases completely computer generated. Secondly, almost as crucial, Soren Over California uses the original iconic Jerry Goldsmith score that we know and love. This film is cut to that original score. The newer film has this butchered, sort of weird version of the score that we know and love where the instruments keep changing scene to scene to sort of try to fit with the scene. And even just looking at the notes, the theme itself, it's very choppy scene to scene. Because of the way it's done, it does not flow nearly as well as the original and it's clearly trying to play off of the original. So why not just have the original? Why mess with perfection, right? Thirdly, there's a lack of obnoxious transitions between the scenes, which are very distracting in Soarin' Around the World, where stuff is constantly flying at you, around you, past you. We're not just talking about one golf ball hit by Michael Eisner here. In Soarin' Around the World, it's virtually every single scene. There's something coming at you or going past you. It's a bit distracting. And the score for this ride, it has that booming bass going on or simple, clean smash cuts. It all works together very well. And it also communicates to the viewer, hey, we actually went out and filmed all this stuff. It is not fake. Fourth, technical knowledge of the Omnimax medium. There's no leaning Eiffel Tower in this original one because the A-Team Imagineers, they made this film and they clearly understood the technical limitations of the format they were filming for, where some guests are going to be viewing this from the sides of the dome, the way that the actual attraction is laid out when you're on it. So the film focuses heavily on scenes with strong horizontal focal points like horizons and aircraft carriers, things like that. The vertical elements, they go from being in the center of the dome where they're perfectly straight to just completely off the screen quite quickly. And the camera utilizes a lot of x-axis rotation, uh, which also sort of makes it feel like you are gliding around. You're actually sort of moving with the wind. You're not just on something where it's perfectly straight and you're just going straight forward. A rather snobby reason to favor the original film, it was actually shot on 70 millimeter IMAX film. And up until 2015, positive copies of that film were still being physically projected from several IMAX projectors behind you every time you saw the show on to the Omnimax dome itself. You could argue this is the best combo where you have the digitized film, so it has the film character, but it's using the low maintenance modern digital projectors because something you guys might recall in the later days of the original film with the original projection system, seeing dust spots projected during the show was a frequent occurrence, which fans theorized had to do with either poor maintenance of the IMAX machines, the IMAX film, or the projection room itself. Now, all of this is a very over-analytical way to objectively quantify how this film that is now playing at Epcot for a limited time, it is the best Soren film. Go see it for yourself while it's around. Many normal people who didn't over-analyze it like I did agree it is simply an awesome film. The sights, the smells, the oranges, all of that. And here's the thing though, Soren Around the World is by no means bad. On its face, it fits Epcot much better than Soren Over California does. I maintain though, Soren isn't part of the world 
World Showcase. It's part of World Nature at the Land Pavilion. And California is particularly noteworthy, very worth highlighting insofar as landscapes are concerned, and those constitute a large portion of this film. So thematically, Land Pavilion-wise, both of these films that we get to enjoy with Soren highlight nature and landscapes, and they both also highlight man's achievement too. So thematically, I think they both live up to the theme of the pavilion as well as Epcot at large. What a great time we live in here where we get to once again enjoy Soarin' Over California, a blast back to the golden years of Imagineering. Be sure to check it out before it's gone. Also of note over at Epcot, it's been ages since I've covered the Epcot Crater. You guys will recall I used to do construction updates almost every month on it back in 2020 and 2021 because that was back when we still thought that we were actually getting something out of having all these walls, out of having wall cots. And what happened is we got Cosmic Rewind, that opened, that was something of substance. And after that, there really wasn't much of a point in continuing doing the Epcot construction updates because everything else of substance besides Moana had been canceled. So every video, I actually filmed some vlogs that I didn't release where I went out there and it's like, yep, it's still a crater. Yep, it's still a crater month after month after month. And after five years here, what we're actually getting in the middle, the part that is still walled off besides Journey of Water, is a cheaper looking, half rebuilt section of the Interventions West that they previously demolished that will be home to festival stuff. And then besides that, you're going to have a bunch of planters and pathway in the middle area, not even the giant fountain in the middle like we used to have. It's an Epcot logo planter, which in the concept art has more festival signage in it. So it's just festivals, 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 spend money on food, spend money on drinking, all that sort of stuff. It's clear that Disney gave up on the Epcot overhaul back in 2020. They cut pretty much everything out of it um, to where we're essentially getting nothing. Uh, we're really just getting planters, pathway, the Walt statue that Imagineering completed years ago, so it couldn't be budget cut out of it. It was already basically done. And we're getting these weird rustic pieces of modern art, uh, which you can sort of spot in there amongst all the trees. There's really not much else of note here. On to what I think is a more positive story. I'm pretty hyped about this. There's an exterior refurbishment happening across from Journey of Water over at the Seas Pavilion. And not to get too technical, but you guys may have noticed lately how when something comes up for refurbishment, instead of keeping everything the same, Disney's Imagineers that do these refurbishments, they have been doing these little faithful updates where the Carousel of Progress animatronics, they get new clothes, the People Mover sign that reverts to the old original Tomorrowland styling, same with Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor and so on. So the reason we are getting all these little piecemeal updates as part of refurbishments actually has to do with Reedy Creek's building code, which is extremely strict compared to the state building code. It is nuts. It's a big reason why we don't see big updates to old rides at the parks, because the rules for new rides now at Disney are insane compared to the state code. So Disney's district, it requires things like smoke evacuator systems, these giant systems, these ducts that you can spot from aerials on the top of all the new attraction buildings. There's all this brand new conduits and sprinkler requirements and so on. So the issue is, according to our sources, if Disney invests in updating a ride and the value of that update ends up being more than 10% or so of the overall attraction's value, all the code provisions kick in on that attraction. So I'll give you an example. Look at the Carousel Progress. I broke this forever ago and I'm the only person who keeps telling you guys about it because I know this is something that Disney was working on. Imagineering wanted for the 50th anniversary to put a Walt hologram in that intro scene. Adding a fifth scene to the show, doing all of this would mean all the new code provisions kick in on the ride and the Carousel of Progress building, basically, it cannot live up to those code requirements. Assuming that there's a way that it could, and Disney could negotiate something and figure something out where, you know, maybe they could do an update to the Carousel of Progress and bring the building up to code. Think of it like this. So Disney's executives, they say, fine, you know what? Disney fans will give Imagineering 100 million for a Carousel of Progress update. So Imagineering goes, awesome, we have 100 million dollars for a Carousel of Progress update. We can add our Walt scene. Well, before Imagineering can even touch the ride, Reedy Creek, now the CFTOD, says, hey, first, all the code updates need to happen. And we've estimated that those are gonna cost around $300 million. And these figures, 
They're approximate, they're a little crazy, but I don't think they're totally out of the realm of what we're talking about here. It's insane. Proportions wise, this is the sort of thing we're talking about with the carousel progress. So now Imagineering is left with negative money to update the carousel progress. The project would require triple of what the executives put into it. So essentially these Imagineering updates, they're not even super expensive. It's everything has to be done before they can do their update that is making the budgets insane. So Jeff Volley, who controls the purse at Walt Disney World, he's sort of the final arbiter on this stuff. It's actually not the CEO or the chairman. He says, forget about it. We're not doing this. He controls the budget for Walt Disney World. He says, we're not gonna spend that much money on the carousel progress. I don't even like the carousel progress. And this foreshadows the fact that since a real update to the carousel progress would be so expensive, it's likely it gets demolished once something major breaks on it because it's running on borrowed time. It's basically a functioning antique where when something breaks on it, Imagineering just swaps for you know, another used part. And these parts aren't made anymore. A lot of them aren't even on eBay anymore. This thing's from the 1964 New York World's Fair. So this thing is on its way out. Head over to the Magic Kingdom and enjoy the classic attractions we have while they still exist because some won't be around if the current Reedy Creek rules remain in effect, which they will. In fact, the DeSantis board is in the process of making it impossible for Disney even to do updates that amount to less than 10% of the attraction's value. So shout out to the DeSantis board for contributing to the deteriorating infrastructure and lack of new infrastructure at the parks. Brilliant move. Uh, you know, I guess if the goal is to, you know, make Disney fall apart, I guess it's working, but you know, it's like Disney doesn't really need any help. They're already doing a pretty good job. You know, it's like, seriously guys, you have to make it even harder for us to get, you know, updates and, you know, rides that don't fall apart. Just absolutely crazy. So getting back to the Seas Pavilion, what does this have to do with what I was talking about with the Seas Pavilion? When one of these attractions comes up for a regular refurbishment, it's not very costly. It ends up being less than 10% of the attraction's overall value. So it gives the Disney Imagineers the opportunity to do what I call a soft update, where they make little tweaks, little piecemeal changes to the aesthetics of these rides in a way that doesn't amount to a big budget update that would kick in the new code provisions and ruin any chance of us getting any updated theming. So as part of the refurbishment at the seas happening right now in the exterior, new pathway lights have gone in, which look very on theme. I definitely like those. Uh, the seagulls that go mine, 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 they're missing right now, uh, which has some fans, you know, freaking out. The pavilion is being repainted. It's reverting to something approximating the original look of the pavilion back when it was the living seas. And here's what's got fans talking as of late. Very oddly, some of the Nemo characters on that pavilion exterior mural, they've actually been taken down. Now, I have a theory as to what could be happening here. The first and most obvious theory is Disney's just taking these characters down to go repaint them backstage and they're gonna put them right back up. There is another theory uh, if Disney did wanna do something here. So back when the Epcot update was actually still supposed to be something and we had that Epcot experience preview of stuff that we ended up not getting, it was hinted at on that projection mapped model that Imagineering liked and perhaps wanted to go back to that vivid original Living Seas mural they never should have touched. It was actually projected on the little model in that Epcot Experience show, uh, the original mural that you had on the Living Seas. I wonder, and I have no source for this or any evidence, it's just a guess, if Imagineering, as part of this routine update to the pavilion's exterior, is perhaps going to update the mural here to blend the old mural with the existing one that we have, uh, which would be another way to really freshen up this pavilion, which is right by the brand new Journey of Water attraction. Disney will be advertising and have all the media out for. As far as the seagulls are concerned, I strongly suspect that those will be back in a jiffy. They're probably backstage right now getting some fresh mechanical parts and a new coat of paint and all of that. So hopefully those guys will be back quite soon looking quite fresh. I anticipate as more of these pavilions around Epcot come up for these refurbishments, Disney will continue to do this strategy with the sneaky soft updates that they've been doing lately. The land now, for example, now is new pathway lights. The Imagination Pavilion, that one has to be on the list. Uh, that one definitely has a refurbishment coming up at some point soon here. And I wonder if they're gonna revert the Imagination Pavilion to the original paint scheme. It's actually been depicted with its original paint scheme, the blue and purple paint scheme, on some recent Journey into Imagination related merchandise that Disney sells. Another small news item which shares the same theme 
Over at Mission Space on the other side of Future World, they updated the pathway. And yet another example of an Imagineering soft update here, they worked with NASA's Perseverance Mars rover team to put in a new chunk of pathway that replicates the tread marks left by the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars, where Imagineering actually got to use one of the real prototype rover wheels. We are getting these little signs of life that there are Imagineers who are like us that do try to live up to the Walt era principles who actually get it. And the real issue here is that they are simply constrained by budget and perhaps by some of the bureaucratic leadership type of stuff, both at Imagineering, as well as of course, with the broader overall company, and especially with the parks level executives like the president of Walt Disney World and the VPs at the Walt Disney World parks, who control their budgets and tell Imagineering what to do. They are the client and the Imagineering basically proposes creative to the client, which is the executives over at Walt Disney World. It's just interesting because every time Disney begrudgingly gives Imagineering a little bundle of cash for a refurbishment like this, we do see cool updates, especially at Epcot, that are true to the vision of the park. Imagine if there was someone in charge at Disney that let them do more stuff like this instead of extremely cost cut IP inserts. It's not impossible, we just need the leadership that enables their Imagineers to be creative. Last up in Epcot news today, the barges for the upcoming Luminous show are making their way into the middle of the World Showcase Lagoon. I have to say, I'm a fan of the infrastructure Disney's done for this show. Show. They have these scaled down, non-screen harmonious barges going in, which are low profile and don't affect the sight lines too much. Crews spent months putting in pilings for all these little permanent mini firework launch platforms, which should make that awesome Epcot Forever perimeter firework effect a permanent feature of the World Showcase Lagoon firework shows. My only mild concern with these barges is if they remain out there permanently all day, every day. I really hope they go away and show up in the late afternoon each day. That would be the best case scenario. It does look like they are rigged up to be something that can go backstage to the backstage marina. The bigger issue with Luminous, which is supposed to premiere officially on December 5th, is the creative on the show. A couple weeks ago, I dropped a report on this story over on the Mickey Views website. So make sure to bookmark the Mickey Views website. There's lots of stuff on there, which I don't necessarily always cover in these videos. I'm always writing about stuff over there. Anyways, we have sources involved with this project who have provided me some very limited visibility into what the deal is uh, with the creative on this one. So the creative was done on Luminous. And the show was recorded. The actual music was recorded by the symphony orchestra. Okay, we're all ready to go. And in the 11th hour, the Disney executives decided, hey, we don't like this score. So now Pinar Toprak, who composed it, she is out of the project and Disney brought in a new crew to redo around 70% of the show's score. The big question is, will this mean we get a better show? That's the real linchpin for this show. The infrastructure looks good. It all comes down to the content. Is it a Disney clip show like every other Disney fireworks show? That would be kind of lame. Or will it be something that is unique or has some sort of personality to it where it belongs in Epcot and it can stand on its own? It actually lives up to the theme and it becomes a long-standing institution that people make the trek to Epcot just to see, as was the case with Illuminations. That's really the make or break here because the reason Disney pays tens of thousands per night to give you fireworks at the end of the night, it's not because they're nice. It's because a show to cap off the night at the parks keeps guests in the park till the end of the night, till late, which means the cash registers at the food booths and the restaurants and the merchandise stands and the gift shops, they keep ringing until park close. And that means Disney maximizes the return on labor costs for those later park hours. Harmonious, according to our sources, performed worse at this than the temporary Epcot Forever show did, and both have performed worse in this regard as compared to Illumination's Reflections of Earth. And if any of you have been to Epcot in the last few years, you've probably noticed that the crowds around the lagoon at night, they don't start building up till a bit later than they used to with Illuminations, and they don't seem nearly as dense in a lot of areas as they used to be back when Illuminations Reflections of Earth was the fireworks show playing every night. So Disney's live entertainment team, they have some big shoes to fill here. Will they meet or exceed expectations? We will see on December 5th, provided the delayed score here doesn't further impact the premiere of this show, which was originally 
originally supposed to have premiered in September. So that's it on Epcot news for now. I want us to get to some of the other big stories across the resort. And then for the real ones who are still watching, we'll then hop back around to talk food because I hit up a lot of the food and wine festival booths while I was getting all my B-roll footage of Epcot. But we have some more pressing matters to get to first. Now we're headed over to the Magic Kingdom to check out the latest progress on Tiana's Bayou Adventure, where all these Splash Mountain animatronics have been ripped out, and I've been hearing some things about delays on the project. Surprise, surprise, on our way from Epcot to the Magic Kingdom, we have some other updates to touch on. First, over at the Transportation and Ticket Center, those moldy signs, I don't know if you guys ever noticed those, but the old acrylic monorail and ferry boat signs, they were really showing their age for many years. And finally, maintenance got the money to go through and put in brand new updated acrylic on those signs. And on the new monorail signage, they even added LED color bars underneath the monorails themselves to reflect those now under each of the real monorails, uh, which correspond with the different color monorail stripes to improve driver visibility at night, uh, where the different monorail drivers can identify the other color monorails on the track, as well as their position. And it was also sort of an unofficial 50th anniversary era aesthetic update that they did there. Really cool stuff. And I love those little details, like adding that to the sign here. Really, really awesome stuff. What I like to do when I have time and I park at the Magic Kingdom parking, I actually like to walk to the Magic Kingdom. The issue is currently you can't do that because due to Polynesian construction, when I was there two weeks ago, the pathway between the Polynesian and the Grand Floridian was closed. Now, sometimes they have a temporary pathway which is open, uh, but the time that I was there two weeks ago, it was closed. So you have to take a monorail, from the Polynesian to Grand Floridian, and then you can get off and continue your walking journey from the Grand Floridian to the Magic Kingdom. So firstly at the Polynesian, half the thing is a construction site. And I have to tell you, DVC people, regular guests who were there, and even some cast at the Polynesian are not exactly stoked about this new building. For folks like myself that love Disney for the themed environments, this new DVC tower, judging by the concept art, looks very much like a new apartment building in modern day urban hipsterville. It has all the modern design tropes and all sorts of goofy stuff there. There's very little that's Polynesian, that's tiki themed about it, uh, which is a very mid-century style. It's a very specific style. And this tower does not even reflect the colors that are used across all the rest of the resort, namely the brown color, the yellow, the orange, and the lime green accent colors that you have across the rest of the resort. All the other buildings have those colors. But like everything that Disney adds now, it directly contradicts what imagine Imagineers did previously thematically, which is so disrespectful, and it probably shouldn't surprise you to know that the leader of these Walt Disney World Resort updates is in fact not an Imagineer, but rather an outside hire from Las Vegas. Now, here's what's interesting. In the hotel's current concrete pour state, unthemed, from this point on, not to sing my own praises too much, but I think that I could manage to take it from how it looks right now to something that actually fits in with the rest of the resort and looks like it's always been there but it doesn't seem like that's Disney's goal. They want it to be something that sticks out like a sore thumb, that looks brand new and modern and doesn't fit because they are trying to attract some new crowd of people that aren't current Disney fans who are gonna see this and then want to go to the resort and all the while they're alienating their existing fans. Some of them are DVC people who spent a lot of money uh, to stay at places like the Polynesian and call them their home resort. The reason I said DVC people and guests that I saw at the resort and even cast at the existing Polynesian resort aren't that happy about this new tower, some of them it isn't because they don't like the aesthetics of the tower, uh, it being modern and ugly. They don't like it because of the strain that they think it's going to put on the existing resort facilities. Think about it, the restaurants are already slammed, the parking lot is already full all the time. Now Disney's plopping this dense house housing development looking thing on the resort property, which is going to further strain the existing infrastructure that was designed and installed back in the 1970s when the resort's accommodation calculations did not include this massive tower. 
Lastly, before I cover the latest Grand Floridian D theming, while we're on the topic of DVC, I've got a little breaking news to drop for you guys right here, which probably no one else will pick up on for another half a year, because there's really not a ton going on in this department, but it is something that I've heard. And that is, I have heard that the Reflections Resort, which had construction suspended on it uh, after it had started over by Fort Wilderness back in 2020, rumor goes it is going to be back on in the future. So they are going to keep stacking up these hotels on Walt Disney World property. And we have heard that Reflections is back on the drawing board after years of lying on the Imagineering shelf. We may get some news from industry reporters about Disney securing contractors for this project again and starting to get a rough timetable together on it in the future, or we may just not hear anything about this and it totally fizzles out. But I do think after this poly tower, that is going to be the next modern looking hipster high rise to go up on the Seven Seas Lagoon. Technically Bay Lake with that one, but Braden, stay on topic. Next up, over at the Grand Floridian, I recently published on mickeyviews.com a lengthy expose highlighting the latest changes at the Grand Floridian, which is undergoing this dramatic transformation, which is still in progress. To sum it up very succinctly, you guys know that not very Victorian, totally different style, modern designed bar that they added years back to the Grand Floridian main building, which is themed to Beauty and the Beast. Imagine that, but it's the whole resort now. That's the way the color scheme, the overall look, that's the way it's all going at the resort. And in some areas, that's less offensive and actually quite welcome to a lot of people, namely the new guest rooms that Disney has been getting lots of good feedback on. Um, you know, a lot of guests that go to the Grand Floridian complain that the old rooms, they felt like grandma's house. And I will admit they did used to look a little bit that way, but that was a long time ago. And also if grandma has Victorian looking stuff in her house, you could learn a lot from her because it's a great style. But for some reason, you know, some of these morons that complain they basically want the Marriott Spring Hill suite style modern rooms at the Grand Floridian while being charged 40 times more a night. It's very bizarre. I'm totally good with room updates, but they should really be something that fits with the theme of the resort. The DVC room updates, they should have done that, something in that style with all the guest rooms. That's how they should look. And I don't think Disney would hear many complaints about that because that is the way that I think that this hotel should look. The rooms are fresh, they're clean, they have modern amenities, but the theme still comes first and it is in harmony with the overall aesthetics of the resort. Now, where the Grand Floridian updates become more controversial and where I strongly rebuke any claim that, oh, we're getting great guest feedback on these, is the updates to the common areas at the Grand Floridian. The Grand Floridian buildings have marble floor with inlay that is white and maroon and a very specific shade of green. It's classy, it's Victorian. It's also sort of timeless. I know that word's thrown around a lot, but I didn't really feel like it was quote unquote old. I just felt like it was fancy. I just felt like it was high end. The walls were a beige wallpaper, which didn't feel like grandma's house. They were classy and they had hidden Mickeys in them. They had all the little Imagineering details, everything you could ask for in a high end resort hotel that was worth your money. The carpets, they were very elaborate. They were custom designed, specifically made to perfectly map the shape of the floor that they were going to end up occupying. Very high-end stuff. Now the auxiliary buildings, the outer buildings, which have received this a new update, this modernization update, where they're combining Victorian with modern, as Disney says on the walls, bragging about this update, they've gotten these watercolor blue modern carpets but some of the old marble trim is still in place with the old color scheme. And while some areas still have the beige color, other walls are now painted the desaturated blue color. There's also areas where it's this like flower theme on the wall. And this actually is technically Victorian. If you look up Victorian design, you can actually find this, but it's a very different type of Victorian theme that doesn't mesh with what the Imagineers originally went with. It's basically the opposite of the colors that they went with for this resort where it's supposed to be warm. So even if you're a fan of Disney ditching the timeless theming this resort had enjoyed since it opened, Disney's only half ditching it. 
So you have this bizarre clash of themes where you have this modern stuff that looks like, you know, it's from, you know, whatever, HGTV, whatever sort of modern thing you want to put on it. And it looks half like the original Victorian theme. And where it gets really personally offensive and where I can admit I'm probably not even the most objective person to talk about this. I usually try to be the most objective, but the main building, which Disney is gradually doing work on right now, they've been working on the upper floors for a while. Firstly, getting rid of the Grand Floridian Orchestra was an unforgivable mistake. That was a major error by Disney. The entire main building was designed around a band being on that balcony. And not only did Chapek send those guys down the river to save some money, even worse, they took that area and they put in bar seating, where instead of marble flooring, you'll notice this, the marble flooring is suddenly interrupted by this lazy, low effort, giant slab porcelain tile that has a wood texture printed on it by a printer. And here's the thing, if you have design aspects like this in your house, you know, it's great, your house is modern, right? But what we're talking about here is a Victorian lobby in the main building at Disney's flagship resort where people spend 10 grand or more on these main building guest rooms. And in that context, this stuff is an absolute joke. Someone from Floor and Decor could probably drop us a quote in the chat on what Disney spent on this tile, because I'm guessing $3 a square foot, maybe less than that. They opted for this instead of the marble they had. It's just absolutely amazing. Over the past couple of months, the lobby floor, the main lobby, the part where you have all the seating, it was temporarily walled off while crews used the space to repaint the ceiling and the columns in the main area. They needed the area to set up cherry pickers and things like that. And this part of the update I think is fine. They did make some changes. They replaced some of the white parts with beige. But what is really strange is now the scrims blocking views of the upper guest floors, they are starting to come down. And there it is, that desaturated blue color from the Beauty and the Beast bar that is now what they're using in the concierge area in the main building. You'll also see they have the trendy modern brass wall sconces, and this is really odd. So you can argue, you know, beige and pastel blue, they're both colors that are used in Victorian design, right? Here's the thing, Disney painted the hallways on the upper three floors of the main building gray the most prevalent modern paint color, gray. This makes no sense. That's right, the main building, they took out beige hidden Mickey wallpaper and painted the walls a middle gray color. So now, all day, if you look up when you're in the lobby, it looks weirdly dark up there now as the natural light that is coming in, it's no longer being reflected by the bright warm tones that we've always enjoyed in this resort. I know all this sounds very, 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 very nitpicky and some people are saying, Brayden, get a life. Firstly, I do have a life, but second of all, I just really, really like this resort and seeing what they're doing to it, it's not good. Some people get hung up when I talk about the minutia and they say, Brayden, it's just minutia, who cares? But here's the thing, it's the minutia that most think doesn't matter that is actually what makes Disney Disney and is why we go. So to see Disney paint over it with gray paint, it's sad stuff. And if you want more examples of just total de-theming weirdness, Disney just got done drilling the marble out of the flooring in the elevator. And it probably could have used a refresh, but you know what they replaced it with? Nope, it wasn't marble that goes with the rest of the flooring you have on those two floors that the elevator services. Nope, they put in gray flooring and then they painted parts of the wall inside the elevator that desaturated blue color, uh, which I guess is now the accent color across the resort. Now on the second floor and first floor, Disney has not gotten there yet. We are still okay. It still looks like the Grand Floridian we know and love, but even if Disney stopped right now, which they aren't, even if you are a fan of the new modern non-Victorian look they're putting in here, there still are vestiges of the original design that Disney is too cheap to get rid of, which clash with the new design. They replaced beige with gray. They put in this desaturated blue color everywhere. They drilled out marble for a bunch of modern stuff that is a totally different look that does not jive with everything else you have in the resort. But Disney isn't going so far as to replace the entire floor, the entire look of the resort. They're only replacing some stuff stuff. So you have this clash of themes. So at this point, Disney has to go through with changing the rest of the lobby to this look. So even though the lobby, the bottom floor, it has not been touched yet, I do think that it is going to be touched. And to add insult to injury, this is the craziest, most bizarre thing, you guys. I've been highlighting this on videos for years, hoping that Disney would fix it. There have been dirty plastic tarps 
and painter's tape on the back of these skylight stained glass domes that the original Imagineers went to great lengths to source. You can plainly see these from ground level in the lobby. You can see how disgusting the reverse side of those stained glass pieces are. And even after blocking off the whole lobby, repainting the ceiling, they've still yet to send a single living human being up into those rafters, up to those domes, and to go in and take this stuff off. It's been sitting up there from some previous refurbishment, something they were doing. It's been like that for many, many years, almost a decade. It's absolutely insane. It's just crazy to me that people spend so much money to stay at this resort, the main building rooms especially, and here in plain view of the guests, we have a battle going on between the old guard Imagineering and new HGTV Las Vegas outside hired design uh, that's visibly seen throughout this resort, which is rapidly losing its identity. It's now several things at once. It's all over the place. I was kind of thinking about this too. So they painted, they added some new paint in the lobby. They actually did paint some stuff beige and they also added the blue color and they're definitely going to be doing more of that. We have a look at the swatch book here. The thing with that is the beige and the blue I think that's what they already have at the Yacht Club. They already have something very similar going on with the deluxe resorts over at the Epcot Resort area. And the Boardwalk room updates, they are so bad, I've heard that Disney already has plans to redo the rooms they just redid. So when every resort hotel has the same Ikea look with the same modern furnishings, the same modern amenities, the same color scheme, it really presents the question of why not stay at the Spring Hill Suites, which I'm not even kidding, has the same gray and blue color scheme and modern room amenities and modern furnishings. Also on Disney property, by the way, for a tenth of the price a night. Disney is rapidly approaching a situation where the only selling point of these deluxe resorts is the prime location. And some folks said, Braden, Disney has to modernize the Victorian Hotel. They have to compete with the Four Seasons. They just have to get rid of the theme. That's just what you have to do. That doesn't make any sense actually if you think about it because this Victorian hotel had things that gave it a competitive edge over the Four Seasons. There were amenities and things that this had that the Four Seasons didn't, like the beautifully themed Victorian lobby which had a live orchestra. Does the Four Seasons have a live orchestra all day in their lobby? No. So actually Disney is cutting out everything that differentiated their flagship deluxe resorts from other competing flagship deluxe resorts like the Four Seasons, because it seems to be Disney trying to be like everyone else instead of everyone else trying to be like Disney, which shows that Disney doesn't get it. That's as plain as I can put it. The fact that they're trying to do what everyone else is doing instead of doing their thing, that is not a good sign. It's like the company hates themselves or something. They are actively going out of their way to rip out stuff that their fans love that gave their product its identity in favor of being generic, doing something like what everyone is doing outside of their resort. And you might say, oh, Brayden, you think they should go back to the grandma rooms. No, I actually don't. I completely get why the rooms at Disney's resort hotels need to be updated on a consistent basis and have all the modern amenities in order to stay competitive in the marketplace. The differentiation that Disney used to understand that they clearly don't anymore is that the modern amenities should be the backdrop while the theme of the room and the resort at large, that's the foreground. That's the main thing when you look at the hotel, when you look at the rooms, and they're complemented by all the modern comforts and amenities. Look at the Grand Floridian DVC rooms. I say again, they struck a perfect balance there. Now Disney's redoing all the resorts where the modern amenities and modern furnishings are the main and almost only feature. And then once they have the modern room planned down, out, then they add all these little cutesy Disney intellectual property nods, like literally stickers. I'm not even kidding. They actually just put stickers. You know, they get like an intern to make like a Photoshop thing and they put it, it's a sticker they put on the wall that has like a silhouette of, you know, one of the chipmunks on it or, you know, an Incredibles character. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. So they design a modern looking room and then they just add stickers that have a nod, like a cutesy little nod to Disney intellectual property. A great example is look at this Polynesian DVC tower we were just talking about. It's clearly a hipstery apartment building. That's what it's themed to look like. And then they're just putting in these little, little Polynesian looking patterns on it. 
Most of you guys know what I'm saying. It's unremarkable, it's removing product differentiation with their competitors, and it's pushing people towards staying off property. Because less and less is proprietary about these resorts, there's less and less benefit to staying on property versus off besides the location. So a lot of people say, hey, I'm just gonna stay off property at this modern hotel, because you can stay at a modern hotel, like I was saying with the Marriott Spring Hill Suites that opened at Flamingo Crossings not many years ago on Walt Disney World property, you can stay there a lot cheaper than the Disney resorts. And what makes the Disney resorts the place to stay is how they are different from these modern hotel chains, right? You go over to the Port Orleans Riverside area and it's so awesome, it's so unique that you get to stay in a mansion, are you kidding me? That is so special. That's the stuff that Disney should be doing, not these stupid towers, which are just a way to put something at the top that generates extra revenue, being able to sell, you know, the firework view, whatever. I mean, it's very, very base level economics behind it. They're not trying to do something creatively amazing. They're not trying to push the boundaries. They're just going with what's easiest, what's not risky, what's not pushing the bar, what's not gonna get anyone fired. And it's disappointing because Disney used to be about taking risks. And with all that being said, if you still disagree with what I'm saying and you say, Brayden, I'm still going to the Grand Floridian. I love the new rooms. I'm gonna enjoy this new stuff. You know what? I really hope you like it. I hope you enjoy it. But I just want you to know it could be so much better. That's why I'm saying this stuff. It could be so much better. All we need is the right people in there. It just drives me crazy because the sky's the limit with this stuff. And you know, they're not even aiming for the sky. They're aiming for ground. They're aiming for uh, drilling out the marble and putting in like a bunch of printed porcelain tile. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, finally hopping over to the Magic Kingdom, we've got fancy fall decor all over the front of that park. Disney always does a great job with that. I spent a decent chunk of my footage gathering mission getting Magic Kingdom footage of absolutely everything. Every sign, every attraction, every everything. There are a couple of projects happening over at the Magic Kingdom right now that are of note. Namely, the Hatbox Ghost is going in. I actually think he might already be there. I think he might be installed now behind those walls um, where he is in the attraction. He's early on in the attraction before Madame Leota. Disney says late November he will be fully operational. The big visible news at Magic Kingdom is obviously over at Splash Mountain where Disney spent this year removing the old Song of the South theme and putting in the Tiana theme, which goes a little deeper than um, like a character movie IP swap. It goes a little deeper than that. So as someone who grew up in Georgia, with the Georgia Red Clay, which is the geographical feature and setting for Splash that really you know, defines the exterior of the attraction. Our dirt really does look like that, by the way. It's pretty nuts. A big part of what Disney's doing here insofar as the visible work that we are seeing is replacing that Georgia Red Clay look on the exterior with a more New Orleans look, which means the red dirt is becoming a very swampy, moist looking dirt color. There's a lot more of the plant life where it's not just green grass, it's all sorts of vines and flowers and things like that. They're applying moss all over. It's quite a different look versus the old Georgia theme insofar as the geographical inspiration of the attraction's exterior is concerned. We have very little visibility on the inside progress of the building, of course. I did capture some close-up views of the splashdown area uh, where you come down and hit the water. They are doing paint work in that vicinity right now. Where we can see some new theming happening is from the Frontierland train station as part of the Walt Disney World Railroad. At this point, as you can see, the old Splash Mountain entrance marquees and the Brer Bear statue, they are long gone. And now some new hardscaping is starting to go in with these new rocky curbs. And there's also some uh, new uh, sort of like cement planter looking things uh, that sort of have maybe like a little bit of a French flair to them, I would say. And then out the back on the train station from the platform, you can see where the old Splash Mountain switchbacks were and the outside part of the queue. And then you have that first interior you enter, that first building you enter, which has now been painted yellow. And there's a Tiana mural that is being painted all over it. It looks very colorful. You're looking at it here. This is actually what they're painting on this building, this is where you're going to enter the attraction. They're still working on this. There's some parts where it's still just the outline of some of the characters from the film. And in other areas, it looks like it's more showing different people, different types of people and things like that in the mural. You guys see what I mean there. Not much more to say on that right now, besides the fact that we've heard this project has, surprise, surprise, run into some delays. 
Um, I hope that it's still gonna open in 2024. You know, good old Disney lately, even when they have the strong financial incentive like they do here to finish a project quickly, what you have to understand is Splash being closed is losing Disney money because people like Splash and it's adversely affecting park capacity because it's a very, very popular attraction. So with that attraction being down, it means that you can fit less people in the Magic Kingdom. So even here where Disney has strong operational reasons to try to get something done, with haste. It's always something, isn't it? This isn't even a new attraction. It's just an update to an old attraction where they're doing like an IP swap and an animatronics infrastructure swap. So you could say it's a new attraction, but you know what I mean? The bones of it, that building, all that is still mostly the same. They are actually putting on the top of the salt dome uh, for the new theme. Now it's not a mountain anymore. It's a salt dome. They're putting the mesh on the top uh, to basically round out that hill the hill uh, that you have there since it is no longer Splash Mountain and they got rid of the log, the tree that used to have there on the top. So Imagineering is continuing to work on this update of Splash Mountain, retheming it into Tiana's Bayou Adventure, and I will keep you guys up to date on all of that. Now that we've covered the big updates at Walt Disney World, we can really start to get into some of the bonus content because I have been all over and I have some great stuff to share with you guys. Lots of tips, lots of little things that I noticed. First, we are going to start off with a rare topic for this channel, food. Over at Epcot, I recently did Rosen Crown, which is over at the UK Pavilion. That's a sit down restaurant. I've done that many, many times in the past. We got the outdoor seating during the fireworks. It was walk up. I didn't even reserve it. I just walked up. I said, hey, can we sit over there? Like, yeah, sure. Uh, it wasn't a super busy time. That was in late August, uh, which is sort of when the summer crowds are starting to die down. Late August and early September are a great time to go to Walt Disney World, by the way. Had a great time there. It's always a great time at the Rosen Crown. Over at the Germany Pavilion, I recently did the beer garden for the first time. I'd never even been in that area, in that interior there. It is such a great atmosphere. I was loving the very, very classic Imagineering. And also, I really felt like I was experiencing old school Epcot Center. You know, you're waited on and entertained by actual Germans. You have the live entertainment. You have an array of food selections in the buffet that are quite unique. Some really, really good stuff. For a drink, what I got was it was a sparkling water mixed with apple juice. So basically like a sparkling apple juice. Uh, it's a drink that they have over there uh, in Germany. I think I made that by myself before at home, but it was quite good how they did it there. I enjoyed that. Um, in one of those uh, mugs, those big, big mugs. I had several plates of food, uh, which you're looking at here. I thought the salmon was quite good. Something called the sausage salad uh, was interesting as well. It had a very bold flavor. I liked that one. There were some things that I missed food-wise, especially on the desserts, because I was kind of like avoiding sugar that day or something like that. Obviously, the apple strudel dessert with the vanilla sauce that you can put on it, it is an all-time classic. I did have that, so I didn't really succeed in avoiding sugar. Also, I got the apple juice thing, so what am I even talking about? You can also find a version of that apple strudel with the vanilla sauce um, during the festival in one of the booths, actually. Speaking of the Food and Wine Festival, I tried a bunch of stuff. So the first thing I went to, the first thing on my list was the Japan booth. Now, for people who are, you know, Mickey Views pros, where they've really, really been listening to me for a very long time, they know that growing up going to Food and Wine, and even in 2019, after I moved down, I would frequently go over and get the spicy tuna roll at the Japan booth during Food and Wine. And what I loved about it was, first of all, it was a very, very good spicy tuna roll, but also it was a hand roll which basically means it was a full sushi roll that was cut in half at a diagonal angle. And then each portion that you would order, it was one of those halves. So what you basically had was half a sushi roll that you could just walk around eating. They did it that way for many years. I think they had spicy tuna for like a decade straight. Then they got rid of it during the events of 2020. And since they did all sorts of very strange, bizarre stuff with the Japan booth, they had like the fruit sushi. I'm like, I'm not having that. They had uh, like sweet ramen. I tried it and it was not very good. And it was really nothing that hit the spot nearly the same. It was basically lots of gimmicky stuff that, you know, you go on Instagram and you say, I tried this weird sounding thing. I am pleased to report that the spicy tuna roll is now back, but it's no longer a hand roll. So you have to go find a trash can to eat this on top of. And it looks like you get three pieces of sushi here. So it looks like the portion size compared to the old days has actually gone down a bit. A little bit of shrinkflation happening there. And I will say it's a pretty good spicy tuna roll. It's not as good as the one that they used to serve. This year it has these weird orbs on the outside part of it there on the rice, as you can see. I don't know what those were about. I feel that this year's food and wine tried a little too hard to be quirky 
and experimental with everything where, you know, there's like an anecdote that you can make about every little food item where you really want to post it on Instagram and Facebook and say, look at this strange thing. You know, lots of folks, lots of viewers of ours um, who recognized me while I was there, I was asking them what they liked at this year's festival. And a lot of them told me that they didn't have a main favorite this year because everything was either pretty good or not good at all. And I think that's because of the gimmicky stuff. That's what I'm saying. So there's stuff that's pretty close to being awesome, but they purposely kind of went a little different direction with it. You know, like the sushi roll has the little orb things on it or like they just, everything is like a little off from how it used to be because they're trying to keep it fresh. They're trying to keep it different and it really feels like you're trying new stuff. And I do think that Disney needs to hone in on those classics and have stuff that is at food and wine every year that is a mainstay that people love and can depend on and then also have some of those more quirky experimental food offerings. So as far as my recommendations, if you are heading out to this festival this year, number one, far and away, the Canada booth. You know, you just hang a right. Once you get to the World Showcase, you're gonna have the Canada booth right there. You cannot go wrong at that booth. And word has gotten out about that. Here you can see there was quite the crowd a couple weeks back when I was there, quite the line here on the weekend. Here you can see some culinary folks uh, that are working on the food, having a good time. At this booth, there's a lot of good stuff. You've basically got a mini dinner that is very filling that is sold here, which is the filet mignon dish, which doesn't even just come with filet mignon. You actually get a pretty good portion size usually. It also comes with mashed potatoes and butter and the price is not bad at all. Also at this booth, there is the very famous Canadian cheddar cheese soup, uh, which gets a lot of good reviews as well. Heading around the world showcase, another all time food and wine classic is the warm pudding cake. Over at the Ireland booth, you would love that. I guarantee you it is awesome. Everybody loves that dessert. It is a great, great one. It's been around for many, many years. Over at the France Pavilion, I really wasn't feeling any of the booth offerings. I'm not having escargot, sorry. So we went um, to the patisserie, the quick service that is in the back of the main part of the land, not the ratatouille section, the main section that you've always had, the patisserie back there. We went and got this dessert. I'm not actually sure what this is, um, uh, but I just know that we did our best to try to cut it in a fancy way and it did not work uh, because of the chocolate that you have on the top there. Across the World Showcase over in Norway at the iconic Kringla Bakery Og Cafe for a year now, my favorite thing there, the troll horn has been missing. Um, and that was the best in my opinion. It had a really, really interesting filling to it. They still have the school bread, uh, which I haven't had in many years. I recall last time I had it, I personally didn't love the taste. I tried it one time. So I've always been a big fan of the troll horn. So this time I tried a different offering. I tried a newer thing that they have now, which translates to world's best cake. It's a vanilla cake with custard and almond meringue topping, which I'd say, you know, it was okay. Um, maybe I would go with the school bread next time. That's kind of the main thing there. That world's best cake, I wouldn't even say it's the best cake in Epcot. If you're looking for a breaded dessert right now during the food and wine festival, I found something that I think people are sleeping on that is actually quite good over at the Simmering Sips booth, uh, which is in the port of entry area, sort of heading towards Canada, the refreshment port, that side of the port of entry. That booth seems to rarely have a line because it's mostly just drinks, but they do have one food item, the guava cake, which has guava bread, this fancy whipped cream and coconut topping. This was a really fun dessert. Now, is it a mainstay like that dessert offering over at Ireland? I don't think it's at that level, but there is a novelty factor with this guava cake and combining that with the taste itself, it is not bad. It is definitely not a bad dessert pick. If you are looking for something to try out, something that I thought would be really good that actually wasn't, over by Germany, you have the Alps booth where they have dark chocolate fondue. And for the price, there's just not that much to remark on here. The fondue, it was fine, but you just don't get very much stuff to dip the chocolate in. And you also don't get much of the chocolate itself. You get a very, very shallow portion in that cup there. And the biggest issue with this was, it was actually everything around getting the fondue, which was a huge, huge calamity. I don't know what was going on. So I thought, as apparently everyone else did, that the dark chocolate fondue would be an awesome thing to have to enjoy during the fireworks. So 25 minutes before showtime, I go to order it at the booth and past the cast registers, there was this giant holdup, just a bunch of people waiting around, waiting around, waiting around 
And we were waiting there until the fireworks started. Just a line building up of people waiting on dark chocolate fondue. Apparently there was some production holdup where they didn't expect a lot of people to want fondue before the fireworks and a lot of people did. The other two dishes that I tried um, were over by the creation shop. So one was at Coastal Eats where I got the oysters Rockefeller. I don't think I would recommend that. I found it to be a little bit cold. It didn't taste bad, but it didn't seem the freshest. What I would swear by though, is the other thing that I got over there uh, towards Test Track, that booth that you have um, in the cool station area, the pickle fries. Get those, get those, get those. Those taste very fresh. You might even need to wait for them to cool down. They are gonna be hot when you get them. I think they even put dill in the fry batter itself. Big recommend on that one. So that was my culinary journey around Epcot, both food and wine and otherwise. Always a great time on that stuff. Before we get on to more food talk over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, I've got something much more major to report for you guys, which is relevant to your upcoming trips that I have noticed. And that is that guys, Lightning Lane has not been going great lately. I don't know if it ever did go great, but especially lately, there's been lots of videos where you have a big Lightning Lane line, very little standby line. Now, I just wanna say from the outset, I am not telling you guys going on a once in a lifetime vacation, not to get Genie Plus or Lightning Lane. In fact, if you're going and this is like your one time to go for a long time, you wanna maximize the number of rides you can hit, just go for it, just go for it. You basically have to, to be honest. But in my case, as someone who doesn't really care that much about the rides, to be honest, I'm more about the atmosphere that you have walking around the parks. I never have and I never will purchase one of these products because it's extortion. And paying Disney to use what has always been a free service just enables them to make the park's product worse and worse and less fun and make the standby line slower. Because the reason, if you think about it, why do you want to skip the standby line? What's wrong with the regular line? Well, it's because the standby line moves super slow. Why does it move super slow? Because of the lightning lane line. So then you say, okay, standby's slow, I'm gonna go skip the line. And by doing so, you make the standby line go even slower. So it's all a total psyop where if nobody did this silly thing, the regular line would move extremely fast. And we know this because that's how we had it for a year, a few years back where there was no fast pass or lightning lane. It was just like the old, pre fast pass days that old fans would always tell me about and they said Braden it was awesome and we got to experience that for a limited time in 2020 it was awesome you rarely saw waits over 40 minutes and I'm talking about even after the park's capacity was basically back to normal you rarely saw even on big rides the wait past an hour it would just go it would just go it was awesome because you had one line that they were dealing with it was very, very efficient. Anyways, so people spend good money on this thing, right? On this upcharge where the day of, they have these big families and parties where per person it's $15, $20 to skip the line. And here's how it goes. So lately, a lot of big attractions at Disney have been experiencing maintenance problems uh, where they've been down half the day, the whole day. We've had some weeks the past few months where Pirates of the Caribbean is shuttered the entire day. I was over at Hollywood Studios a couple weeks ago and Slinky was down for the day, technical difficulties, and Disney sold all these Genie Plus, skip the line, Lightning Lane, whatevers, for this and all sorts of other rides. So, well, we can't use it here. Let's see what else we can use it on. And they go to the attraction across the street. So I'm going through Toy Story Land, I'm getting some film photos and all of that, and I noticed that there's a cast member holding a sign saying the line starts here but it said the lightning lane starts here and there's this big line snaking outside the front of Toy Story Mania. Yet the standby line, there was no visible line, not in any of the outside part. And the outside part of the line is actually pretty extensive. There's a ton of switchbacks in there and all sorts of stuff. The standby, it was totally visibly empty from the exterior of the attraction in the lightning lane line. It was totally backed up. So I post this on social media and all these Bob Chapek extortion racket defenders who say their prayers to the almighty mouse every night, they went on the defensive and they say, oh, Brayden, that's just the line for the touch point to make sure that you have a lightning lane. Guests are kind of slow and don't really get how it works. But once you tap through that tap point there, you're basically on the ride. It's the skip the line line. But we know that's not true. In fact, if you look at the video I posted, you can see not even 10 feet past the touch point itself, you can see the actual verified lightning lane people in the lightning lane line. It's all the way backed out outside of the attraction. And that's how it was all night. They were backed up outside of the attraction 
for lightning lane. So you have a line of people who are trying to skip the line, who are in a line to tap in to then get in the skip the line line, which realistically was probably like a 40 minute wait. And that's a privilege that they paid for, which is absolutely shameful. On Disney's front, they failed these guests. And over at Soren, here's the real kicker. I actually timed this one. I got in the standby. I saw how long it took me to get on the ride compared to the people in the lightning lane. So when I went to check out the new old Soren, same exact deal. There was a line for lightning lane extending outside the entrance to the attraction. There was no visible line for the standby from the entrance area. The posted wait was 70 minutes. Disney revised it down to 50 minutes for the standby. So I take the standby and I am just soaring. I had my own Soren film. It's called Soren Past the Lightning Lane. I just went past all those people and they paid money to be in that line to skip the line, quote unquote. I was the one skipping all of them. This is crazy. The standby line didn't start until I turned the very last corner to that hallway before they send you to the theater hallways. I was right near the merge point. So the posted standby, as I said, it was 70 minutes. Then they revised it down to 50 minutes. It turns out I timed it. I waited 20 minutes in the standby line before the merge point, after which I was merged with Lightning Lane and everybody else, and we were sent into the theater hallways. But then, and here's the kicker. So once we were in the final load area, waiting to actually you know, get to the pre-show and then get on the ride, the ride stopped. Our theater wasn't working for a while. There was some technical issue. In fact, that day, an entire third of our theater was down for technical difficulties. So ironically, the wait ended up being the posted 50 minute wait that Disney told me it would be, but but that 30 minutes of technical difficulties, that was past the merge point, meaning all the paid Lightning Lane people and even the VIP tour people who spent tens of thousands to get on rides without having to wait at all for that day, they all had to wait with me in that line because the ride was down. We were all just hanging out there for a while. That was past the merge point. So I can tell you guys confidently that as I'm soaring past all those people in the lightning lane, I beat almost all of them onto that attraction, I can guarantee you, and I didn't give Disney an extra dime. They paid to wait probably twice as long as I did or even longer because the theater was down, so that means that the loading was impacted, but I was already past the merge point. You know, I was the next customer up. Um, and they were still all waiting in that line. It's just absolutely crazy. Now, is this technically an anecdote? Yes, but go on social media and every day, people who are on Disney, you know, Twitter and Instagram, they can attest to this. Every single day, there are videos where there are giant lightning lane lines outside of rides and no visible standby line. Am I saying that if you're on a very special vacation that you don't do often, you know, don't do lightning lane and just stick it to Disney and only do standby? No, in fact, I actually recommend that you do have lightning lane as an option because because in net, you can probably squeeze in a few more rides during your valuable vacation time that you worked very hard for. I just want you to be aware that this stuff can happen to you. And especially if you are a frequent visitor to Walt Disney World or you're a pass holder or you're a local, there is no need for you to pay the extortion money. You shouldn't, you're enabling Disney. As I said at the end of the mickeyviews.com article on the topic, here's to hoping ex-CEO Bob Chapek's extortion racket comes to an end soon. Unfortunately, genies are hard to put back in the bottle. Some fun stuff on the Hollywood Studios footage gathering that I was doing, the Tower of Terror, it's an engineering marvel. It's definitely an Imagineering highlight. It is such a great ride. It looks so good. The building was so well done. Everything about it inside and out, just a 10 out of 10 attraction there. Sunset Boulevard also happens to be really awesome during sunsets year round. So highly recommend uh, you checking out that area during a sunset. You'll definitely get some good photos. I ended up doing Fantasmic, uh, which I don't normally do, uh, but I didn't do the try hard way, meaning that I didn't like show up hours in advance and wait a long time to get the perfect center view. I actually showed up like some imbecile right before the show started and I didn't wait at all. I breezed right in and I got seated very close to the front actually. I had a great view, albeit I was off to the side, but it's still definitely not a bad view by any means as you can see here. It was pretty awesome. So don't think that you need to wait hours and hours during your you know, valuable park day to get the best view at Fantasmic unless you're really 
hung up on wanting that dead center view, you do need to show up early for that. But if that's not something you're concerned about and you just want to, you know, have a good seat somewhere in the theater, I mean, really, you can show up quite close to the time that the show starts. I would recommend getting there 30, 20 to 30 minutes early um, if you're not too picky about where you're seated, which you really shouldn't be because, you know, unless you have a hard time seeing, uh, you should be able to see everything quite well. While I was at Hollywood Studios, I also hit up the Brown Derby. Uh, also, I did that one the non-trip planner way where I just decided, hey, you know, I feel like a famous Cobb salad, one of the best dishes at Walt Disney World, one of the best salads in the world. The Brown Derby invented a lot of this stuff. They do a great job. And you know what? I said, you know, I just want to do the Brown Derby today. And they actually have a walk-up area. They have a lounge. It's an outside seating area. So I did a walk-up reservation on the app. And probably within 10 minutes, they called me over. I got my seats. I got my food. I got my Cobb salad. I asked the waitress for a non-alcoholic drink that would look kind of like fancy on camera for the video here. Um, and I don't know what exactly this. Usually I just see, you know, like Sprite or root beer or something like that. Or water, of course. Um, but this is something where it was like Sprite mixed with some other... Uh, thing. Um, I don't exactly recall what this was and I couldn't actually find anything about the non-alcoholic drinks on the website, uh, on the online menu. Uh, so there is some stuff on this menu that you just have to see in person. There's some extra stuff on it that isn't on uh, Disney's app online. Then hopping over to the Animal Kingdom, they've got the Disney 100 icon out front that people take photos with. Firstly, I thought this would be of general interest. I just wanna highlight this real quick. So at all the parks, because I had my nice heavy equipment and I had my tripod and all of that, I needed a locker most days. So this is the locker area at the front of the Animal Kingdom past the turnstiles. They have these locker areas uh, past the turnstiles at all of the four parks. And at Disney's Hollywood Studios and the Animal Kingdom, you have two sizes of locker. There's a small and a large. And I used my hand here to give you guys an idea of scale for each of these different sizes. So at the Magic Kingdom in Epcot, there's an additional size called the jumbo size, which is even bigger and more expensive. Now with my pretty substantial tripod, which is allowed in the park, it does abide by the rules, but it's right up there at the limit, it fits quite nicely in the large locker. Now I have to put it in sort of at a diagonal, um, but I would highly recommend doing the large. It's $12 for the entire day. It's two extra dollars from the small and you can fit a backpack in there. Now, if you do the small locker, it's a little bit more like if you have a loose camera or if you have a purse that you wanna put in there, but you know, it's not really at that size where you can have like a full size backpack and shove it in there. For that, I would highly recommend the large. And if you're someone who is gonna be getting a bunch of merchandise or has some really big stuff on you that you don't wanna carry around all day, then you're definitely gonna to wanna to opt for the jumbo at the Magic Kingdom in Epcot. And I think that these lockers are not a bad price. For the value added to your day here, I definitely think these are worth it. You know, not having to carry everything around the entire day. As far as the Animal Kingdom itself goes, it was a ton of fun to film. I shot most of this two weeks back, the weekend I was in town for the Bright Line opening. Just an absolutely beautiful park. It has my favorite quick service restaurant at Walt Disney World in it over at Pandora, which is an awesome land. Uh, that's one of the recent things Disney's done that I really, really love. They have the Satuli Canteen. I used to always get the slow roasted beef with the rice and beans and the green onion vinaigrette. Unfortunately, recently due to the beef that they were using being too expensive, Disney switched to smoked beef, smoked chimichurri braised beef, which I tried for our last live stream and it's just not the same level as the slow roasted beef. So this trip, I actually tried to switch it up a little bit and I went with the chopped wood grilled chicken bowl with the rice and beans and green onion vinaigrette. And I thought that was a great combo. I can highly recommend that for sure. It's really impossible to go wrong at this quick service anyways. Everything there is so, so good. I'd also highly recommend the blueberry cream cheese mousse dessert offering, which is quite special that they have there. And some years during the special holiday seasons, they even have special versions of of that cream cheese orb uh, where they'll make it pumpkin spice flavored or do a peppermint one. That's something that they've done around the holidays some years. Although I will say in recent years, I haven't seen Disney do those. Uh, so maybe they don't do those seasonal ones. Maybe they didn't sell very well. Uh, so they stopped doing them, but who knows? We'll keep an eye out for that. You guys can probably hazard a guess that as part of my footage gathering, I went over and captured every square inch of Dino Land in 4K. And when I went over to the entrance area for Dinosaur to capture that, 
there were a lot of people over there and so many people kept coming up to me, probably because I had a tripod, and they were asking me to take their photo with the attraction, which I found quite remarkable because it seems like it's an attraction that people really like. Uh, there were a lot of fans that wanted photos with the dinosaur, with the building. Uh, maybe they're all just, you know, knowing that it's about to go by the wayside and be rethemed to Indiana Jones, but Disney says they're still working it out. It's sort of still in its idea stage, so who knows? Uh, maybe this attraction will stick around, although chances are this entire area is going to become something new. When that'll happen, we will see, uh, because it does seem like Disney is a little bit tight on money right now, uh, so this area might stick around quite a while longer. We will have to see. I'm trying to think of any other little stories. Um, I went over to Port Orleans French Quarter several times to get the beignets, and also one night I ended up over at Riverside where I got some film photos of the gazebo you have over there and the Oak Manor facade itself. It's just so cool to me. I've never done it, but you can actually stay in this mansion. How is that for unique? They have some really nice rooms in there too. They're not the overly modernized ones. Uh, these are royal rooms, I believe that they are called, uh, that have this princess theme going on. Uh, there's a little Tiana tie-in and some of the other princesses and stuff like that. And I even stopped by the Riverside Mill Food Court at Port Orleans, where I saw since my 2016 visit, the price on the refillable mug has gone up quite a lot. Lot. Not outrageously so uh, compared to inflation itself, but that is inflation uh, which is showing there. And I've also heard from some people that the mug itself has shrunk since then. So you also have shrinkflation going on too. Everything's getting more expensive and smaller. Crazy, crazy stuff. At the food court, I ended up getting the gumbo, which I don't think I've ever had gumbo before, so I'm not sure, you know, it's really up to snuff by other people's standards, but what Disney had there for food court food, I thought it was really, really good. I really enjoyed that. And even better was a dessert that I got. It's something they called, I think they called it a magic bar. Um, I don't have a photo of it, but it's one of those dessert snack bars where, you know, you take the baking sheet and you throw in peanut butter chips and chocolate chips and coconut and all that stuff. And it was really, really good. It's one of those type of bars. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, and the one that they had here was quite nice. And one more thing food related. I went over to the Contempo Cafe and I got a monorail dessert. Yeah, not to brag or anything. I did some monorail spotting while eating a monorail shaped chocolate brownie thing that you have going on here. It was good. It was actually quite hard to slice through. Uh, we were trying to slice through it real nice uh, so you could see the inside. The inside is hollow, so now you know that. Also during these trips, besides getting B-roll footage for these YouTube videos, I also did some before and after shots. This was another project I was working on where I brought some Polaroids of the parks when they were under construction or you know there, there was old stuff that used to be at the parks that no longer is there, and I was lining it up with the current view of those different areas. So you can compare how it used to look to how that same exact area looks now. I filmed a bunch of those. They're sort of in like the shorts format. So be sure to follow Address Unknown on YouTube, Address UKN on Instagram and Twitter as well. And I will get some of those out. I'm not gonna post the shorts on YouTube. Those will be on Twitter and Instagram. And on YouTube, we're gonna reserve that for the documentaries that are on the way. And of course, we already have two up there on the Address Unknown channel, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already. Also guys, I have a big news story uh, for the Mickey Views fans that are excited to hear this. The Mickey Views store, which has been down all year, prepare to write your Christmas list because the store should be back up in a few weeks with some brand new stuff. You can go over to mickeyviews.store and you can actually enter in your email and I will let you know when the shop is live and I'll give you a discount even uh, for when it first goes live for that first day or first couple days like that. It's not gonna be spam or anything like that. It's just to let you guys know when it's up and when I'm dropping new products. What's really exciting is you guys are going to get to see some of the film photography that I've been doing at the parks over the past year and a half. Something that I've really gotten into. There will be prints for sale on our store, which I'm really happy with. They turned out really, really nice and I'll continue to build those up and uh, continue to post more and more photos on our socials as well. Since November of 2021, I've been using this guy right here. Uh, this is my 35 millimeter film camera. It is a Canon A1 with a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. And I got this for around $300 on eBay with shipping. And I've become the master of this thing. It's like an extension of myself. I've used this thing so much at the park. I think I've put around 100 rolls through this thing now. And each roll has 36 exposures. And every single bit of the film that has gone through this camera, 
I developed myself in my apartment right next to the studio in Orlando, like right next to my set. I was there developing film all the time. I shot so much film. Here's the thing though. Recently, I shot a roll of slide film where I've previously screwed up developing slide film because it's pretty difficult. It uses more chemicals. It's a different chemical process than the other types of film. Um, and with all this developing stuff, the temperatures have to be exactly right. The times have to be exactly right. Really, it's an expense thing too where it uses a different chemical process and I didn't want to have to spend money on the chemicals right now because I only needed one roll developed. So I said, you know what, Braden? Just send it to a lab. Just send your film to a lab. First time I ever did that. You wanna know what I got back? Pretty much destroyed film. I have no clue what happened here. I checked the camera for light leaks. It's not even possible to get sprocket shadows in the middle, like down the middle of the film strip like this. You can't even produce that from inside the camera. So it's not a light leak in the camera. It's something from the manufacturer, the distribution, or the lab screwed up. I have no idea. I am going to give that lab another chance because there is a strong possibility, I suspect, that somewhere in the chain of custody before I got my hands on this film, it was involved in some major screw up and I basically got scammed uh, when I purchased this film on Amazon. So despite the lost effort on this roll, driving around getting the photos, spending a lot of my time, paying for the film itself, paying for gas, paying for Disney tickets, paying for development, paying for more driving to get the film back, all that, uh, you can get a glimpse of some of the scenes that I tried to capture here at Hollywood Studios. I did some long exposures in Galaxy's Edge at night where all the people who did the lightsaber building activity, they had just gotten out and they were starting to take their photos of the Millennium Falcon. I'm really happy with how that rendered on the part of the film that ended up turning out. Nice proof of concept there. So I'll take another crack at it in the future. And now that I've really put this 35 millimeter camera through its paces, just this week, I took a big step up financially um, and just, you know, in my evolution of doing this type of photography, I finally got a medium format camera, a 645 camera, which means that the negative can be up to six by four and a half centimeters in dimensions. That's a big negative. Now, there's even bigger formats, um, but this is like the first step up into the medium format type of thing. The exposed area usually on 645 is a little smaller than 645, but basically what this means is the photos that I'm going to be able to take now will give me 2.7 times the resolution and detail compared to my existing photos that I've been taking on this 35 millimeter camera. Now, here's the problem with a larger negative. That sounds great, right? More resolution, bigger film, all that. You can make bigger prints, more prints. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. I really wanna do a lot of prints. What this means is you're gonna have a much larger camera. So are you guys ready for this? This right here, is the new camera. It's a bit of a behemoth. It's a little bit bigger than this guy, as you can see. <laughs> um, and this is the Mamiya 645. So this is my new camera. This set me back a pretty penny. It was $650 shipping from Japan on eBay. Uh, and that's for everything that you see here. Um, honestly, compared to what the prices have been like the past five years, historically, it's actually a pretty good deal for a fully functional uh, Mamiya 645 Super like I have here. The issue is, is um, there's a bunch of little accessories and things that I wanted for this thing. And those were like each like 100 or $200. And then it's like 60 or $80 shipping. It's crazy. So um, that added up to like over a grand uh, getting everything that I need for this camera uh, to be able to make it modular and really take advantage of it and be able to make it a little bit more compact. So all this is to say, stay tuned for some even better film photos on the horizon. This thing is clunky and I only get 15 exposures per roll in this guy. So this is not something that I got for novelty where I was like, oh, I just want to see how medium format works. I'm really going to master this thing. Um, and I'm going to be very selective with my compositions because film is not cheap. The photos on this, it's like over a dollar per photo. And that's not even factoring in development costs, gas, all that other stuff. So this is some serious stuff here. It's a pro piece of gear. Uh, for a medium format SLR, this is actually quite small. There are ones that have a bigger negative that are still technically SLR that are actually somewhat compact, uh, like the Pentax 6.7 SLR is quite popular, and it's in the same sort of price range. Um, but I decided I wanted to go with something modular here with the 645. And this guy that I'm calling a behemoth, there's actually even a much larger version of this camera, uh, which is the RZ67, uh, which was made by the same guy, uh, the same designer. 
and that camera is pretty famous because it was used to capture the famous Windows XP desktop, this camera's older brother. Uh, so I sort of like a mini version here uh, where it's not super crazy, it's still something I could realistically bring to the parks, I think, and it won't look too insane, uh, but really anything past this form factor and you're getting into crazy territory because the end game with analog photography is, you know, large format with those ones with the bellows, those really old looking cameras. Those are awesome. Those to this day are like the most capable cameras that exist because cameras are built around physics. So, you know, like when you have like a nice iPhone camera, really it's doing a bunch of like algorithm type of stuff because you know, the light that's let in by the lens, it's it's all about the size of the lens itself. That's why the cameras are always kind of getting bigger on the iPhone as they try to improve the picture quality. So what that is to say is even those really old cameras actually capture really good photos. And that's why if you look at really old stuff um, from a very long time ago, we still have very high resolution photographs from things from a hundred years ago or you know even before then. And that's thanks to the fact that you know cameras, they've been pretty good for a long time. And those large format cameras have amazing resolution. I'd love to get a panorama 6x17 camera for shooting landscapes and architecture. On this topic, I think I recall a viewer once telling me uh, that I met that he has taken his 4x5 large format camera, film camera, to the parks before, uh, which sounds pretty crazy. I've never personally seen someone doing all that. You have to put the uh, thing over your head uh, to even be able to see, like actually focus it up on the focusing screen. It's very, very archaic uh, compared to our modern uh, standards with this stuff, but the results are not archaic. They're beautiful. I know all this analog photography gear talk is probably over a lot of people's heads or they just don't care. Or, you know, it's like, who cares? This doesn't really relate to Disney too much, but here's the thing, the end results that these cameras produce, these film cameras especially produce, um, they're really spectacular. And what they're able to do is in a very nostalgic sort of way, capture memories of the place that we love, that we talk about here on this channel. And that's the part of this that I'm talking about here that is most certainly relevant to my channel, which after all is called Mickey views. This analog stuff is not for everyone getting, you know, everything developed. It's a bit of a hassle these days and you need to avoid x-ray machines. Those nuke the film. So you have to ask the TSA for a hand check and over at Universal, they have a lot more issues than at Disney. So they have to use the real deal x-ray scanners. Uh, those are not good for film. So that's another reason why I don't really go to Universal. Disney, they have these nice 5G scanners, which do not affect film. From my tests, I've gone through with very, very sensitive film. And not only do you have to deal with getting it developed, did I mention you have to get the negative scanned and digitized so you can actually show them to your friends? Needless to say, there's quite a lot to this. It's definitely not for the faint of heart. There's a lot to be said for digital. It's definitely a lot more convenient and there's some amazing digital cameras out there. I'm filming with one of them right now. Um, but if you want to give this a try, all this film stuff, it, you, there are some awesome results and you get all sorts of unpredictable results that are quite cool. Uh, you can go over to Walmart right now and for not much money, buy yourself a Fujifilm disposable camera and you should be able to get that turned into most drugstores as well as the Walmart photo centers. And it'll be a little bit of a delay. It'll be a couple weeks, but you will get your photos back. And I see a lot of young folks who I definitely don't know much or anything about film actually using those disposable cameras in the parks and sending them in to either Walmart or drug stores or mailing them in a padded mailer to one of the major labs that you can find on Google. So there are ways uh, to test this medium out again uh, if you haven't done it in a while or if you've never done it. And I definitely would recommend it. It's a very, very fun thing to do. It's a very fun activity. There is a novelty to it and um, or you can end up going down the rabbit hole and really trying to get actual very, very good results. And that is what I hope to accomplish here. And you'll see some of that on the Mickey View store when that opens hopefully next month. So all this is to say, guys, I'm working on some big stuff and none of it is very cheap. We got so much going on uh, with this film photography project where photos that I'm doing for this are gonna be included in the Address Unknown documentaries. That's a big reason that I'm doing this. And of course, also in the Mickey Views and on social media and the store, you know, with prints and also just cool photos and social media, doing a lot of stuff with this. I got a lot going on. As you can see, we got more Address Unknown content on the way, more documentaries on the way. So much going on. There's also some projects I wanna do with Mickey Views. I've got a lot to get to. And here's the thing, guys, we keep this channel corporate sponsorship 
free. You've probably noticed that. I don't say this was brought to you by whoever. We get emails every day, you know, for all the usual ones you've heard of, the VPNs, the this, the that. And I don't really know how I feel about that. So as you probably noticed, we don't do that here on this channel. It is viewer funded. We have our patrons over at patreon.com slash mickeyviews who give us monthly contributions, which is very, very generous. And then also we have PayPal for one time or recurring donations, or you can do your day-to-day -day Amazon shopping through the affiliate link uh, that we have on our website. And we get a small commission at no additional cost to you. And also, we are looking for and collecting vintage Disney photos for some of our historical work that we are working on. There's lots of ways to support the channel. If you enjoyed this long form news video, which I'm sure took days and days for me to edit, because I talked about a lot of different stuff I have to go find the footage of, oh boy. If you'd like to know how to contribute, head over to mickeyviews.com support. I really, really appreciate it. It's plenty enough. I really appreciate it, those of you who made it through this video. Not that it was a hard watch, hopefully. I hope there was a lot that was entertaining entertaining in here and educational. Uh, hopefully I got some good tips for you guys as far as the food is concerned and got you caught up on all the news and you know some of the passionate side tangents I go on uh, with some of the theming and de-theming happening at Walt Disney World. I hope this is something that you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you guys thought. That's the latest in the world of Disney today. Be sure to subscribe with those notifications on so you don't miss videos like this in the future. Thank you all so much for watching. From the Mickey Views Magic Studio, this is Brayden. I'll talk to you soon. Have a magical day.